I think we're going to get started. So I'm Erin, and today I want to uh, walk you through uh, an end-to-end -end data analysis using Python that I'm calling uh, bot or not. I hope you're not in too serious of a mood. This isn't a very serious talk. Um, so <laughs> I just want to start out by saying that as, as far as I know, and, and uh, admittedly I wouldn't probably know, but I am completely human. I have, I have cats. I have a normal job just like everybody. Um, I'm a research scientist at uh, Amazon Web Services, and I work on a product, oh sorry, I've been instructed to stand here. Uh, I work on a product called S3, and prior to that, I was a data scientist in the Nordstrom Data Lab, uh, headquartered here in Seattle, uh, or over there in Seattle, uh, where I primarily built product recommendations for Nordstrom.com and for our targeted uh, uh, marketing campaigns. I'm also uh, one of the co-organizers co for the Seattle chapter of Pi Ladies. Woo. Uh, <laughs> um, and so Pi Ladies, if you haven't heard about it, uh, hopefully you have by now because we've been uh, telling everybody, but is, Pi Ladies is an international mentorship group for women who program in Python, and we have a really active chapter here in Seattle. So if you're local, uh, come out to some of our events. Here's some that are coming up. We also have bi-weekly hack nights, so just bring your project and, and code with us. Uh, these, are, these are free and open to the public, so Pi Ladies and Pi Laddies are, of course, welcome to our, our talk nights. So come see us. So today I want to talk to you about uh, the internet phenomenon known as bots, and specifically I'm going to talk about uh, Twitter bots. And I chose this topic uh, primarily because bots are pretty fun and they're, uh, they're often pretty funny. Um, but also because Twitter has a really rich and comprehensive uh, API that allows just regular old users to get access about the platform and how people are using it. And so I think it's a really great, uh, it, it serves as a really great demonstration of uh, Python's prowess for data processing tasks, uh, but I think also uh, kind of shows some, some areas of weakness uh, with Python. Um, and so I'm going to talk just as much, or if not more, about how I actually uh, conducted the analysis as the results themselves. So for those who aren't uh, familiar with Twitter, if you're not already a user, Twitter is a social media platform on which users can post um, 140 character fart jokes, essentially, called tweets. Um, yeah, wow. Well, the manual said to open with a joke, so this is, this is going to be a long talk. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it's distinct from other social media in the sense that, uh, for one, by, by default, your, your tweets are public, so anybody can view them. Uh, and secondly, there's, there's not really any expectation that you necessarily actually know the people who are following you or who you're following. Um, and so you can think of it kind of more as uh, a marketplace of ideas uh, where the currency is faves and retweets uh, versus something like, like your Facebook. Another distinguishing characteristic of Twitter is the embeddability of Twitter content. So it's really common nowadays to see news media uh, where tweets are embedded in, in the actual article itself. Um, or, as in this case, uh, where the, I don't know if you were following this, uh, I was, where uh, the tweets are the source of the news themselves. And this, uh, the pervasiveness of Twitter across these other outlets is due in no small part to the openness of the API and the ability for developers to programmatically tweet or access timelines or, or get uh, account level information. But the same openness that makes Twitter so pervasive across the internet uh, on platforms that are not Twitter um, also opens the door for unwelcome users. And in 2009, 24% of tweets were generated uh, by bots. Um, and last year, Twitter disclosed that about 23 million of its roughly 300 million active users were actually bots. And so that's just shy of 10%. And if I, uh, I, I would bet that th that's probably an, an underestimate. Oops, sorry, woo! So what are Twitter bots? Uh, so bots are nothing more than uh, programs that, oh, they're robots in disguise, get it. <laughs> they're, they're programs that uh, can compose and post tweets completely without uh, human intervention. And so they range really widely in, in kind of capability and complexity. So some are, are fairly inert, they don't do much, but kind of look spammy and follow you, maybe <clears throat> fave and retweet some of your uh, your tweets. Um, 
but then they, they can also be quite complicated and they can use really sophisticated algorithms to uh, compose text that's really uh, convincing. Um, but either way, both, both of these types are uh, unwanted for Twitter because they undermine their uh, marketing attribution and, and ultimately uh, their bottom line. But Twitter has to take kind of a nuanced approach to how they handle this, uh, handle the bot infestation because not all bots are the same and not all bots are spam bots. In fact, some are beloved members of the Twitter community. Take, for example, Olivia Taters here, who is a bot who tweets kind of in the tone of a teenage girl, as you can see, uh, always charming Olivia Taters. Um, and when her account was suspended, I think about a month ago, very recently, uh, her uh, followers protested until it was reinstated. So the strategy of, uh, as, and you can see why, the strategy of, uh, <laughs> of just like identifying accounts that are bots and, and destroying those, those accounts is not going to, is not gonna work if, organ if uh, Twitter wants to keep kind of the organic uh, community driven uh, nature of its platform. So today I just want to <clears throat> walk through uh, the development of a classification algorithm for identifying accounts that are likely to belong to bots. And so essentially what we're doing here is testing the hypothesis that bot behavior is somehow measurably and meaningfully differentiable from the behavior of humans. And we have a pretty simple experimental design. We're gonna ingest some data from the Twitter API and then clean and process it and then create and validate a, a, classifi a classifier. And luckily for us, we can do all of that uh, with Python. So I'm gonna communicate with the Twitter API using the Python Twitter module. Uh, clean and process data using pandas and a little bit of NLTK. Um, and then I'm gonna create a classifier with scikit-learn. Um, yeah, create and validate a classifier with scikit-learn. Okay. Mm. Shout out to these mineral waters. Um, so our first step is to, uh, is to get some data. So we're gonna, we're gonna develop a classifier here and I wanna take a supervised learning approach which means that I need labeled data. I need to know, uh, <laughs> I need to know um, ahead of time which accounts belong to bots and which accounts belong to humans. Um, and in the past, this has been done uh, basically by grad students. So you get a bunch of grad students, you get a bunch of accounts, you send them off, uh, and in their infinite time, they, they go and they basically apply like the Twitter version of a Turing test. So they're gonna go look at a bunch of accounts and they're gonna kind of check them out and say like, if this looks like a bot and it kind of tweets like a bot, we're just gonna call this thing a bot. But the trouble with that methodology is that I'm not a grad student anymore and my time has value now. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so, so that's not gonna work for me, but uh, I've, it turns out this was, this was a fairly easy problem to solve uh, because of my great friend Charlotte here. Um, so this is a website you, you may or may not be familiar with. It's a, it's a little gem called Fiverr, where for up to $5, anybody can purchase um, kind of dubious services, um, one of which is to buy uh, a bunch of real Twitter followers. And I know what you're thinking, because I, I kind of thought this myself, uh, you know, is Charlotte the, the real deal? Is this gonna work out for me? Um, and it turns out that Charlotte is, in fact, le totally legit. And, uh, <laughs> and just, uh, just over 24 hours, I had 5,500 at the time. Uh, great imaginary friends. Unfortunately, uh, I took this screenshot relatively recently. And as you can see, a lot of good, bo a lot of good bots died out there. So this is something that Twitter is, uh, Twitter is actually cracking down on. And a lot of my, my friends have been, unfortunately, destroyed. So I know. <laughs> Uh, so that's great. So I knew who was following me prior to purchasing all these bots. Uh, and so I could unique, I could identify them, positively ID them as being humans for the most part, human, human like, uh, and then the 5,500 bot or 5,500 accounts that now follow me, uh, in the next 24 hours, I can positively identify as being bots. Um, and so great, I have labels now. I know exactly who's a human and who's a bot. That was easy. Uh, so now all I have to do is create a feature set. I need some variables uh, about these accounts. And lucky for us, there's no reason to, uh, to turn to kind of these shady uh, terms of use breaking uh, strategies to do that. We can just simply use the Twitter API uh, and follow their rules and not get kicked off of Twitter. Um, so I focused on two primary endpoints. The first was get users lookup. Uh, and so that's gonna be kind of your profile level information. So stuff like, 
are they using the default profile picture, like that Twitter egghead, um, default profile colors, how many tweets have they made, how many people are following them, how many follow, how many do they follow? So kind of the stuff that you could get if you were uh, looking at uh, their, their account page online. And then I looked at the status, of the user timeline. So this is their actual tweets. And so for uh, each uh, account in my data set, I grabbed the last 200 tweets that they made. So up to 200 uh, tweets for each person in my data set. So I did all of this using, uh, th so there are actually several modules for connecting to the Twitter API through Python. Another big one is uh, TweePy. But uh, I chose something really simple, really easy to get started with, and a pretty uh, literal implementation of the API called Python Twitter. You can find it here. Super simple to use. Here's an example of what a, a little wrapper around a function uh, might look like. So the function get friends IDs, uh, that's going to uh, take a screen name and then just get, pass back to you the, the IDs of people who are following you. And this is so simple, uh, you might wonder why you would even bother wrapping this uh, in something. Uh, and the answer is because there are rules around here and Twitter's not just gonna let you roll in and ask for as much data as you want all at once. And so this is the uh, timelines endpoint. And so what you can see is that I can only ask for 180 uh, users uh, information in 15 minutes. And so uh, we can't just do, sim we can't just simply send all of our stuff to the, the a all of our requests to the API at once. <clears throat> so part of how I uh, solve this problem is with uh, this really charming function called uh, blow chunks, which, uh, yeah, <laughs> um, which uh, returns a generator. So what it's gonna do is it, the data variable there is gonna be like, for example, your list of uh, user IDs you're gonna give it that, you're gonna give it a max chunk size, and the last example was about 180 IDs. It's just gonna, it simply chunks up your data into 180 ID pieces, and then it yields it. So this thing doesn't actually return anything immediately, it returns a generator. And what I really like about this implementation is that it doesn't assume anything about how you actually end up distributing that work across. Um, so I did something really simple, but you could imagine if you had a bunch of a API keys, maybe you had a bunch of bots so that you could send multiple requests to the API, uh, without breaking those rate limits, um, you could still use the same, uh, same generator object. I didn't do that though, I did something simpler. So here's what I did. Uh, so this is, this, is, would be, this is a chunk or a piece of, of what was inside kind of a, a wrapper function around this uh, call to the API. But so what I'm doing first is uh, creating my chunks with my, my blow chunks uh, function. And so chunks is, is a generator object. And then I can use the next method associated with generators so to, to grab the first batch of queries or the next batch of, of queries. Um, and so what that's really, it's kind of like you've got, you've got this queue and it's all chunked up into 180 uh, ID chunks. It's gonna just grab the next one. And then I can take that chunk, send that to uh, the API, and then I can grab a beer or uh, take a shower or take a beer in the shower because I have now 16 minutes that I'm gonna wait before I send something else to another request to the API. And so once that 16 minutes is over, it's gonna go back up, get the next chunk, send that to the API and, and do it all over again. When it finally gets to, uh, when I have nothing else to ask for, next time I, I call the next method on chunks, it's gonna throw a stop iteration exception uh, and that's going to break me out of this while loop. Uh, and then I can continue on and do some processing stuff. And so this is how I, this is how I got around, I didn't get around it, this is how I obeyed Twitter's uh, rate limits. So this is what, uh, this is an example of what you might get back. So this is just the example uh, payload from the uh, user endpoint. So it's stuff that you would expect. So the name of the account, the location if they've uh, indicated it when the account was created, kind of profile level information. And it's just a big JSON blob. So at the end of that, I ended up with about uh, 8,500 uh, accounts in my sample size, so uh, more bots than followers. Uh, so about 3,000 humans and about 5,500 bots. Okay, so that's cool. Now we have a bunch of data, and now we need to pre-process. Mm. So the data, the, what was coming in from the API was uh, 
all a bunch of JSON blobs, but unfortunately that's not a very useful format for us for, for doing modeling. So we need to do some processing. Uh, but the thing about kind of processing and cleaning is that it's really boring to do and it's boring to talk about and it's boring to look at. So I'm not going to talk about it or make you look at it except for to tell you what I did. Um, the first thing I did was basically just flatten out the JSON so it, was, so it would be one row per account. Um, and then I did a little bit of recoding. So Twitter uh, has kind of a, a convention that uh, for some of its Boolean variables, it will only be non-missing if it's true. So like uh, was retweeted will only have an entry if it was retweeted and it will be uh, missing otherwise. And so I just recoded that so that things would be, so that false would be represented. Um, and then I selected out only what I wanted to use for modeling. So the, the payload was, was pretty big and it contains, you got, it, it's kind of meant in, in part to be consumed by machines. Uh, so like if you were an application developer and you were building an application that let you, lets you view Twitter, um, it gives you a lot of information about like the dimensions of media that they post, the dimensions of photos and stuff like that. That is not, that's interesting for a machine or for an application developer who needs to render that correctly, but not interesting from my point of view where I'm just trying to see if there's anything funny that comes out from this classifier. So I removed it and only kept stuff that I was kind of interested in looking at. So then I end up with some beautiful uh, clean data, columnar TSVs, and that's what I want. That's what I need to use for modeling. So uh, just as a, a quick little aside here, um, I'll be completely honest. I don't enjoy the process of creating visualizations in Python. Uh, and my, my workflow in the past uh, has always been to export things out of Python and, and then plot them uh, using R so that I can have ggplot2. Uh, which is extremely powerful syntax for making visualizations. But in the spirit of PyData, I uh, did not do that. I, I made these visualizations using Python. And, and one of the, the reason I'm telling you this is that one of the strategies I found that kind of ameliorated a lot of the pain for me was using IPython notebooks to do this, um, which is kind of duh, because I, I feel like everybody's been talking about it forever, but I'm, I'm a late adopter. But creating visualizations in the notebook made it a lot easier because you could quickly change things and then refresh in the browser. So I recommend that if you also find this to be uh, cumbersome. Anyway, so what we're looking at here is the number of people that uh, the accounts are following. So these are kind of outward. Uh, and what you'll notice is that for humans, so the bot equals zero, I couldn't figure out how to make these meaningful, but bot equals zero means that they're human. Um, for humans, humans tend to follow around 500 or less people, which makes sense. There's only so much you can kind of read. Um, especially from people on Twitter. Uh, yeah, and so, and, and so that makes sense. And then for bots, what you're seeing is kind of the opposite. People are following uh, more than 1,000, kind of balanced there around 1,500. So they're following sig uh, significantly more people than humans tend to follow. This is long-tailed, so I kind of lobbed it off so that you could see, um, you could see kind of these, these strange distortions and distributions. Likewise, for the number of people following them, so these are kind of the inward uh, direction, you see kind of this really flat, uniform distribution looking thing for humans, which makes sense. Some humans are really popular. Some humans are not that popular. Some humans are kind of bot-like. Uh, but you don't see that at all for bots. You see them really smash down towards zero. So most bots have less than uh, 40, less than 20 followers, really. So you're seeing bots following tons of people and having almost no followers. So that's interesting, and that's probably going to come up again, uh, spoiler alert, in the classification uh, portion. So that's cool. We could do that kind of with the profile or account level information. Um, but what about all this tweet data? So in addition to that stuff that you can get from their profile page, I also got the last 200 tweets that they made. Um, how do you turn all of this stuff into data? Um, well. I used a module that hopefully you've heard about a ton by now uh, called Pandas. And the chief uh, benefit of Pandas is that it gives you this data frame, data structure. And so if you've used something like R or any kind of like statistics domain specific language, you're, you're probably familiar with the concept of a data frame. That makes it super simple to do um, quick manipulations and aggregations over uh, structured data. So that's what I did. So let's just look at an example of how we might do this. Um, so there's a summary, uh, kind of a language summary metric called lexical diversity, uh, which is just the ratio of unique tokens in a document to the total length, the total tokens in the document. 
Uh, and a, doc, a token in this case is just a, any sequence of characters that we want to treat as one, uh, one thing. And so that's typically going to be something like words. Um, or, or on Twitter, it's going to be some weird stuff, emojis. <laughs> um, uh, right. And so I, I computed this for all of the, uh, for all of the, the people in, in my uh, data set. And before I, before I could do this, I took all of their tweets, their up to 200 tweets, I, I put them together in a single document. So I just concatenated all of them. And then I tokenized it. So instead of having a big uh, clump of text that represents their tweets, uh, I had a list of words. And that allows me then to do things like remove stop words, remove uh, emojis, and other punctuation that I don't want to include. So I did that first. And then I have this uh, simple function to compute lexical diversity. So uh, I forgot to mention, it ranges from 0 to 1. So a 0 would indicate that you have no text, essentially. And a 1 would indicate that every word you've ever used in the document was both the first and the last time you used it. So every word is unique. Uh, and it's kind of a measure of your, your language sophistication. Um, and so here's, here's the function. If there is no text, your value is 0. Otherwise, it's just the length of the uh, the unique set of words in your document divided by the total length of the document. And what I love about pandas and where I think the core strength is, um, is the ability to apply generic functions like that over groups of data really uh, elegantly. And so that looks like this here. So the in the first line, and you can actually make this all one big, one, a one-liner, um, but it, I think it's a little easier to see this way. So we're taking our tweets data, we're just grouping by the screen name. And then you can just apply any function on, on top of that grouping. And what I really like about this, besides that it's super uh, easy to read and understand and it's, it's nice and elegant, is that the group by is really generic. So if you had any generic set of categorical variables, maybe you wanted to group by a city that they're in, you could really just quickly iterate and swap those categories out and compute lexical diversity or any generic function over these groups of data using exactly this code. So this makes it really fast to do quick aggregations. So here's what those distributions look like between humans and bots. So we have kind of like this almost like textbook nice uh, normal distribution for humans centered at about 0.7, uh, which is uh, kind of what you would expect. And then uh, for bots, again, you have this really bizarre distribution, a lot of representation at one, uh, and then also more at zero. So indicating that uh, for one, they're not tweeting very much, which would give you a diversity of, of zero, or uh, even a diversity of one would, might indicate that they're not tweeting very much. So if they make one tweet, it's more likely that they didn't use any repeated words, or that they're just re they're tweeting completely random text. So it's, it's less likely that you're going to have uh, overlapping words or repeated words if your text is just completely random uh, nonsense. And so this is, kind of a, <laughs> this is kind of a red flag, probably come up again. So that's cool. So we were able to get all this data from the API. We cleaned it up, and then we summarized uh, some tweet data with a, with a summary metric. So we were able to get that to one row per account so that we could join it onto the, uh, that account level information. So now let's classify. So I use scikit-learn to, to build the classifiers. It's kind of the premier, again, like pandas, you've probably seen it a ton this weekend if you weren't already using it kind of the premier uh, module in Python for doing machine learning. Um, and so since we're primarily interested in predictive accuracy here and not, um, not kind of like inferential uh, information, let's just try a couple different random classifiers and see which one performs the best and then go with that one. So that's what I did. Um, and what you'll notice about this, so I have three different classifiers here, I, naive Bayes, logistic regressions, kind of like your regression approach to classification, and then random forest, uh, which is a uh, bagging tree fancy method. Um, but what you'll notice is that the syntax for these three different uh, classification methods is all exactly the same. So what, what I'm doing is just indicating which method I'm going to use and then calling the fit, uh, the fit function on it. So before I did this, I, I, bro I broke my data into a test and train and identified which features I was going to use. So that's what I'm giving it. 
So for each of those, I can really quickly fit stuff. And then in the second line underneath, all I'm doing is, is predicting uh, with my new fitted thing. So I'm giving it my, my test set and then again my features. And what that predict is going to do is just give me back an array of zeros or ones indicating which class uh, bot or not it thinks it belongs to. And so that's really, uh, really nice that you can very quickly just the exa almost exactly the same code, try out a bunch of different classification methods um, and pretty much out of the box. Okay. Uh, and then there's this great classification report here at the bottom, uh, which will give you output like this. So this will basically just give you a bunch of different, a couple different metrics for accuracy uh, of your classifier. And we can just look at the kind of total precision down here at the bottom really quickly. And maybe not surprisingly, Random Forest performs the best in this case. Um, so this was really easy to get to, but it's a little bit unsatisfying because we kind of just use this thing right out of the box. Um, so can we do better than that? And we can, and it, that's actually also really easy to do in scikit-learn. So using the grid search cross-validation function, just like we did before, we can give it a classification method. In this case, we're going to do random forest because it performed the best in the first round. And then you can give it a grid of uh, values to kind of to, to explore. And so what that is is just a dictionary keyed off of the, the configurable parameters to the random forest classifier, and then all like a range of values. So some of them only have a couple uh, possibilities, so we'll just try them all. Some take ranges of values, but we can give this, this grid to the function, and then we can treat a grid search CV just like we were treating our methods in the past. We can call fit on it, and it's going to explore that space and then fit with the best uh, parameter set, which is really cool. And then we can call predict on that also, just like we were using before, um, and get predictions. And then we can use the classification report. So this is just not super interesting, but this is just what the, the best uh, random forest configuration ended up looking like. Um, and then the, class, the classification reports are here. So we did uh, get some improvement um, on the precision between the, not surprisingly, the, the tuned version of random forest and the default out of the box random forest. So that was really fun and cool and fast. Uh, and so here's a variable importance. So this is basically just your, kind of like your list and your ranking of the variables that were most important for uh, making the classification. Not surprisingly, the friends and followers count are the two most important. Uh, so we saw that bots tend to follow thousands of people, but they tend to be followed very little, less than 20. It's kind of a red flag. Uh, statuses counts, that's the number of tweets you've made. Uh, the account age and hours, bots, I didn't show this, but bots tend to have younger accounts because they get shut down. Um, and yeah, the mean, mean tweet length and stuff like that. So that was really fun and convenient. But I'm going to posit uh, that iterative model development in scikit-learn is still kind of laborious. And to, uh, to demonstrate why I want to quickly take you to another world, another universe where the language isn't Python, but it's R. Uh, and I want to give you a really quick run through of, a, of a, the scikit-learn equivalent in R. And that's a package called uh, Carrot, if I live through this, this talk. Um, so <laughs> the kind of the workhorse function in Carrot uh, is something called the train function. And if you've used pipelines at all in scikit-learn, it's conceptually identical to pipelines. So what you're able to do is give it some pre-processing instructions. So this is, this is not really comparable. This is just an example. But uh, this is logistic regression, and I'm giving it some instructions on how to pre-process my, my data. Center and scale, I could also give it a grid to search, just like before. I could give it some cross-validation instructions if I had specific instructions for it. Then I give it a method, uh, generalized linear model, binomial uh, link family, and so it's logistic regression. So this is, this is exactly like pipelines in scikit-learn. But what I love about Carrot and that I think is kind of lacking in scikit-learn is the richness of the output and the diagnostics that you get. So this is the, the conceptual equivalent of the classification report, so the confusion matrix function. So I can give it my predictions and the truth, and it's going to give me, for one, the confusion matrix, which is a separate call in scikit-learn, uh, and then a bunch of diagnostics about uh, the, the, the predictive accuracy. And so a lot of this you might not be interested in all the time, depending on your context, but uh, it's nice to have it all here. But what I really like about it is that it's super simple to get the traditional inferential statistics and diagnostics out that you would want. And this is, as far as I know, and Jake's here, he can correct me if I'm wrong, but this is almost impossible to get out of scikit-learn. So if you 
develop a model in sci like a logistic regression in scikit-learn. You basically need to refit it in stats models to get output like this, which I think is too bad. Um, because you're going to want to know things like this. You want to know what the coefficient values were. You want to know the p-values. You want to know kind of your goodness of fit metrics. Because to the extent that these assumptions are being uh, violated, they can sometimes influence your predictive accuracy. But it's very hard to get both predictive diagnostics and inferential diagnostics from scikit-learn. <coughs> And one last thing before I stop talking about uh, R at a Python uh, conference is um, the resamples function. And so what this allows you to do is really quickly compare models against one another. And so you can give it this list of, of all the models you fit. So in this case, I was fitting a tree model and a bagged and a boosted tree model. And then I can give that to a dot plot, which is going to just pop up with a couple different, and I think it's configurable, accuracy measures. Um, of these three models, and so I can really quickly, instantly compare the, the performance against one another. Um, this would be really hard, again, to do in, in scikit-learn. There's just not enough like helper or utility functions for getting quick diagnostics, so you can move quickly uh, right now in scikit-learn. So I'm done with R. I'll leave you, <laughs> I'll leave you with uh, a, couple, a couple points. So um, if, hopefully, if you could learn anything from this talk, it's that Python is an extremely powerful tool for doing data analysis tasks. I was able to communicate across the wire to some service, get some data, clean it all up, and fit a, a classification model, make some visualizations all with the same language. This could be one big script if you wanted it to be. Um, and that's extremely powerful. So for a data scientist, for an analyst, anything, uh, investing in, in really knowing Python, I think, is, is a, a great idea. But even so, I think um, some, some tasks are, are more work than they need to be. And I think that uh, is really just an opportunity for people, if they're interested in contributing to open source, to, to look into, and, and especially on the uh, analysis end. I think that the, there's some improvement that could be made there. And uh, of course, uh, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about limitations. So uh, unfortunately, uh, I didn't realize this until I, I began my e experiment. Um, but uh, all of these bots are, are fairly lame. So the bots that are kind of interesting online are the ones that are sophisticated. They, they're funny. They create interesting uh, texts and tweets. These bots all kind of look like this. They're kind of weird. I don't know what they're saying. And they, um, they're just spam bots. These are for sure the ones that Twitter wants to get rid of. These aren't adding anything to community. And they don't do anything that interesting. So they're actually really easy to find. They have almost no followers. They follow tons of people. They have almost no tweets. Um, yeah, so they're kind of like my mom on Twitter. Um, and so this is a limitation. So certainly in, in future iterations, it'd be really cool to look at those more sophisticated bots. And I, I did some hand curating of those um, before I ran out of time. But that, that would be really cool to see how they compare. And so just really quickly, I want to leave you with um, some bot recommendations if you want to start uh, checking some out. So I showed you a little bit of God Tributes before. So if you follow God Tributes, he'll follow you back. He reads your tweets and gets really stoked about things that you say um, and then just like shouts about them and throws up a, a tribute to the gods regarding stuff you said, specific words. And so, yeah, like dog emoji for the dog emoji god. Um, but what I love about this thing is that it doesn't know anything about the level of seriousness of your tweets. And so sometimes you might be having like a serious Twitter conversation and it'll fixate on a word and just like interject into the middle of it, <laughs> something really crazy and stupid. And so, yeah, that's always a treat. Highly recommend. This is probably my favorite bot uh, of all time, or at least it's the bot that I laugh the most at. Uh, see? So highly recommend following this one. Uh, this one follow basically looks for texts like um, bro and dude and dad and man, and then creates like phrases like, why over here when you can bro over here? Now slap me five. So yeah, this one's great. Men things. And then uh, Olivia Taters we talked about. Always charming teenage girl bot. Uh, Funny, and then I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't give a little shout out to uh, Grateful Shopper, who is the bot that kind of started, uh, started me out on bots. So this is a bot created, I don't recommend following Grateful Shopper. <laughs> this, is, this is a bot created by uh, a friend and coworker who we worked together at Nordstrom, and uh, he created this bot on his last week of work um, to spam the social media team at Nordstrom. So, <laughs> <laughs> what Grateful Shopper does is basically get catalog information from retailers uh, and then asks for product recommendations because uh, Jim, this is Jim Valandingham created this bot. So uh, 
he knows that we know that there are, you know, like 24 year old people at the other end of this conversation actually spending time creating these responses. Uh, and it's very funny to waste their time. And so that's why Gr <laughs> <laughs> she also spams Macy's and I think REI and a couple other, uh, a couple other outlets. So um, great example of a bot that Twitter, I think, wants to get rid of. I hope she makes it through. Um, and so that's all I have. Do we have time for questions or any questions? Yeah. Yeah, I will. I don't have it uh, all put in one place, but I'm planning on like writing it up and also post posting a blog post, and I'll I'll release all of that kind of at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I didn't. Oh, you mean like when I manually pulled stuff out? Uh, I selected the features mainly by looking at ones I thought were interesting. So the the what you end up with from from the API is something that ends up being like 300 columns long, and most of the data isn't really that interesting. So I picked kind of the the things that I thought would be that that tell a better a good story. Basically, uh, this isn't like super rigorous um, scientific work here, but I, I just picked like the, the the main things. So stuff like who they were follow or how many followers, how many following, uh, kind of the stuff that you would get, the high level stuff you would get from looking at their profile page. Um, yeah, and then I didn't do much feature selection. There was, there weren't, I ended up with about 20 things, and so I didn't uh, do any kind of like filtering of that before just throwing it into a classifier. Yeah. Yeah, oh, I didn't manually label any of it. I had uh, 8,500 uh, accounts and then, um, oh yeah, and then I split it into like about 80-20 test trained. So whatever 80% of 8,500 is, is what my training set was. Yeah, yeah. For the model data there, uh, as far as I understand, there's one source for the bot traffic, right? Like you, Mm -hmm. those bots from one yep. Stage. I wonder if like you can try other sources, like how variant the bots would be. Any any insights on that? Yeah. So I did a uh, a couple like too close to this to this date. Basically, I started manually curating some of like Olivia Taters and like some of the interesting kind of artisanal bots to include in the in the sample set. Um, and I ended up with about like 250 or so that I manually curated, um, but I, I wasn't able to get all of that kind of uh, done in time, but definitely in a future iteration, it'd be really cool to look at that, especially because we kind of know the, uh, how they generate text, so it would be really cool to compare some of those like the lexical diversity and some of those um, uh, text summaries against humans and against those types of bots, because those are definitely the, the more interesting ones than, than these kind of sp spam ones. Although these are the ones that I think Twitter is, should be focused on eliminating, except for not mine. <laughs> yeah, you're, yeah, in the back. Yeah, so there's a couple, typically what I'll do is um, there's, it's called GG pairs in R, and I did it also in Python, but I don't remember what it's called, but you can make these big like scatter plot matrices. And so I did all my figures in Seaborn, it's in there somewhere, um, that sits on top of matplotlib, but you can create like uh, these big grids that basically plot all of the data, all the combinations against each other. And with those kind of plots, it's really, you can quickly kind of see like where, where things might be happening, where trends are going to be. And that's kind of part of how I also eliminated data from the set and focused in on, on a, a subset of features. But those are, also, those are all, uh, always really helpful because they typically will give you stuff about correlation and stuff too. So you can get a, a kind of a summary of, of quick relationships in your data. 